So my name is Tali Tuchin, as Justin said, and I um, practice in the Technology Transfer and Licensing Group here at Mintz Levin. Um, I've done all sorts of agreements, from straightforward patent licensing to joint ventures, collaborations, um, all sorts of product, product and services agreements, and they all involve some element of technology transfer. Um, they come in all flavors. So I thought tonight that I would give you an overview of what a technology transfer licensing transaction looks like. Um, kind of the skeleton, the elements of it, and um, happy to answer questions along the way. All right. Thank you. Okay. So what is a license? A license is basically granting someone the right to practice your intellectual property rights. You own some IP rights, whether it's a patent um, or some software, and you are licensing somebody else the right to use it. Um, it usually comes in the form of a written contract. Um, and I think a third, the third point here on the slide is important. A license doesn't promise the, the licensee that they'll have the right to do anything with that IP um, that might not infringe or kind of tread upon somebody else's IP. All you're telling someone, if you own a patent and then you're licensing it out, here's my patent, you can practice it and I won't sue you. But that's pretty much all a license, a patent license does. Um, why license? There, if you're a licensor, you have some patented technology, you have some, some IP assets, you might want to out-license those assets for various reasons. Maybe you don't have the um, capacity to commercialize it and to, to draw revenue from it through products or services. Um, maybe you have spent a lot of money in R&D developing that technology and you want to recover that investment. Um, and maybe you just, you know, you're a, small, you're a small entity and you just don't have those resources and you want somebody else to do all that footwork and you can just keep a revenue of royalties. If you're a licensee, you might want to license somebody else's IP because you have some manufacturing capabilities or some sales capabilities, but you don't have the actual R&D development uh, resources. A license in can be a cost-effective means of obtaining desired technology. Somebody else has already developed it, already spent the time and money doing it. All you have to do is take the license and pay the royalties. Um, and it can provide accelerated access to the market. So a license agreement will define the relationship between the owner of the IP, the licensor, and the licensee. So you've got to talk about what is being licensed. Is it a patent? Is it some sort of know-how, software, trademark? And what are the intellectual property rights around it? How have you protected those assets? Um, a license agreement will define a scope of the licensed rights. Maybe it's a certain period of time. Maybe you have exclusivity or, or it's not exclusive. Um, and it should provide all the financial details, like royalties, license fees, milestones, all the different ways to monetize your technology. So a typical licensing scenario, um, basically the licensor is sending the rights to the licensee, and the licensee is sending the royalties back. There are lots of different ways to accomplish this. There are different, different permutations on the business terms here. Um, the rights. How long does the licensee have to use those rights? What are the use rights? How can they use them? Is it limited to a certain kind of product or service? Are there certain products or services that are excluded from this license? An important issue at the top is improvements. Oftentimes a licensor will outlicense their technology to a licensee who will then have it in their possession and they'll maybe tinker with it and maybe come up with some improvements. Oftentimes, the licensor might expect that the licensee would license the improvements back to the licensor as part of the transaction. Licensees might or might not want to do that, um, and that's often a heavily negotiated term. The territory. The licensee will have rights to practice the technology, usually within some geographically defined territory. Sometimes it's worldwide. And then the issue of exclusivity. Are you, the licensee, the only the only entity that I'm licensing to practice my technology in a particular field or territory, um, if you have exclusive, if you're being granted exclusive rights, usually the licensor will expect some sort of minimum commitment financially in exchange, right? So if you're a licensor and you're going to grant exclusive rights to someone, you want to make sure that you pick the best partner. And one of the ways that you can try to ensure that is to have them commit to making some sort of perhaps minimum payments to you over time. 
as a licensor, you can expect back financially um, cash in the form of perhaps license fees, royalties, oftentimes mid, uh, milestone payments that occur on the that occur when certain things happen. Maybe when the licensee has achieved some certain amount of revenue. Maybe if the licensee has achieved certain milestones in a regulatory process, that might trigger a milestone payment back to the licensor. And then again, we talked about improvements. Um, an improvement developed by the licensee, the licensor might get rights to that back to them as part of the big package. So when you're interested in licensing in or licensing out technology, the typical timeline is if you're the licensee, you've identified some technology that you're interested in. If you're the licensor, you've identified somebody who might be interested in taking a license. Um, and then you have to go through a fair amount of diligence, especially if, if you're the licensee. You want to make sure that the IP that you're considering licensing <coughs> is what you need and it's sufficient. Um, and that the licensor has all the rights they need to this particular IP asset to give it to you. Um, once everybody's kind of comfortable regarding what the general IP assets are, um, usually we advise putting together a term sheet, which would outline just the broad, basic business and operational aspects of the transaction. So rather than diving deep into a definitive agreement, a term sheet will help the parties kind of flesh out what the big picture issues are, stimulate some conversations, stimulate some negotiations, um, and just flesh out the terms before you dig into a full-blown contract. The term sheet's really important um, for the reasons I just said. It can really streamline your negotiation process, um, but it should be non-binding. A lot of times you'll see folks wanting to sign term sheets Sometimes people need to do that to show progress to their board or something like that. But really, a term sheet, the purpose of it is to facilitate these negotiations, to just have kind of a good faith, open conversation. There's no need really to sign a term sheet. Um, once you move into a definitive agreement based on what the term sheet has said, it's pretty much good faith expectation that the, 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 the agreed provisions of the term sheet will make their way into the definitive agreement, even if you haven't signed that term sheet. Um, we recommend that each term sheet include kind of the stickiest, most difficult elements. Those, you don't really want to push those off. So um, those are ways to kind of flesh out where those, where those tricky issues will lie. Um, obviously, every contract requires some negotiation, and I just thought I would include a little slide here about some, some tips, I think, that are helpful in negotiating. Um, you may have heard some of these. Separate the people from the problem. Oftentimes, personalities get kind of, you know, um, caught up in some of the negotiations and people react different, in different ways to different proposals. Some people take things personally. Always try to just separate the people from the problems. Keep, your, keep to your term sheet. Keep to objective criteria um, and, you know, just try to focus on the, the getting to yes in your business deal. Focus on the interests, not the positions. In other words, what are the interests of the two parties as far as what they are looking for to what they're looking to get out of the transaction, and not necessarily on the position that they're taking with respect to a particular term. Um, we talked about a term sheet. An issues list is also something that can be helpful. If you feel like you're getting stuck on certain terms, you can put together kind of just a table with highlighting the sticky issues and maybe putting laying out the different parties' positions on the issues and then maybe coming up with creative ideas to work around those obstacles. So um, certain basic licensing terms that you're bound to see in the license agreement, um, naturally you'll need to define the licensed IP, what's at issue. Um, define the product, as I mentioned before. Are you allowed to practice my patent to make this particular widget or only this other particular widget? Um, and in what field of use? Are you allowed to use it in all fields or just in biotech or just in agriculture? Um, we talked about the territory, which is the geographical um, authorized uh, scope for your, your license. And then the definition of net sales. That's always a really important definition in a license agreement. This is the, this is the foundation of how the licensor obviously will be paid. So the licensor will take a royalty a percentage off of what the licensee's revenue was in practicing that, that license IP. Um, the definition of net sales can get sticky. Oftentimes, the licensor will say, well, whatever revenue you generate when you practice my IP, I want X percent of that. 
and licensee might say, well, that's fair, but we needed to invest some R&D expenses, or we had to have some client commissions and rebates and credits and all those sorts of things that we want to kind of take off the top so that we get to a net definition, and then you can take a percentage off of that. So that's a really important term to negotiate. Um, and we talked, I mentioned milestones. Certain milestones within the licensee's industry might trigger some payments back to the licensor. Other licensing terms that will come up, um, I talked briefly about improvements, indemnification. So this is a kind of a sticky legal issue that basically means that if one of the parties to the agreement is sued by some third party, and if the reason for that lawsuit is because the other party to the agreement did something wrong, then the first party might say, look, I didn't do anything wrong and I've been sued, so you need to indemnify me from that claim. So obviously very heavily negotiated. Typically, the licensee will be expected to indemnify the licensor from third-party claims that arise from the licensee's ex exploitation of the IP. In other words, if I'm a licensee, and I've taken a license to some certain patents and I'm turning them into a product. And I develop this product and I make it and I sell it. If the licensor is sued because of something that I've done in that process, it's, it's, it's standard that I, the licensee, would kind of indemnify them and they shouldn't have to worry about it and I'll make that lawsuit go away. Another issue in license agreements is the limitation of liability where basically the parties are trying to limit the amount of exposure they have to damages for a breach of contract. Also very heavily uh, negotiated. Disclaimer of warranties. Um, sometimes you'll see warranties in the license agreement, but oftentimes you'll see a disclaimer by the licensor where the licensor says, look, this is the patent that I have. I own it and I'm licensing it to you, but I'm not promising that it's valid. I'm not promising that it's unenforceable, that it's enforceable, and I'm not promising that it that no other third-party IP is out there that you might need. Um, oftentimes, the license agreement will include terms around patent prosecution, where the licensor is expected to continue to prosecute those patents to keep them alive, so the licensee actually has some thing that they can you know, exploit. Um, and oftentimes, patent enforcement against infringers. If the licensee identifies some third-party infringer out there and says, hey, look, somebody out there is you know, infringing this patent that I'm paying for, and they're, I'm paying royalties and they're not, you, the licensor, need to go out there and make them stop. So those provisions are often uh, negotiated as well. And then finally, the term and termination, obviously important provisions. Oftentimes, a patent license agreement will be granted to the licensee for the entire life of the patent, whatever years are remaining on it. Um, there can be shorter term patent licenses, that's fine, but oftentimes the licensee will expect that because they're investing so much effort and money and resource into launching some product. They don't want to spend all that, all that investment just to have the patent license go away after a few years. Maybe they've built up, built up the market and built up the demand and they expect to be able to maximize that for the life of the patent. And then termination rights. Um, typically, termination is um, only going to be allowed in the case of a breach, but usually a licensee has the right to terminate the license for their convenience anytime they want. Um, sometimes licensors don't like that idea, um, especially if they're expecting some sort of minimum annual kind of financial commitment. But at the end of the day, if the licensee is looking at this and saying, look, I can't monetize it for whatever reason, typically a licensee is allowed to terminate for their convenience. So that's it. Trying to keep it short in a nutshell of um, what a license agreement looks like. I know it was a lot of information. I'm happy to answer any questions before I hand over to Brian. Can I get two questions for you? Uh, first one deals with illegal use. If I as a licensor find out that the licensee has used my product or my services illegally, people are hurt. Is that indefinite? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a great question. So you definitely want your agreement to say to the licensee, look, you have to comply with all laws, right? It's a kind of fundamental obligation on the licensee. So as soon as they start, as soon as they violate that, you have the um, grounds to terminate the agreement because they've breached it. But yes, if they've done something illegal and now somebody's knocking on your door, that's where the indemnification comes in where you point to that and you say, look, somebody's bringing a claim against me, 
It's not my responsibility, so you make this claim go away. Sometimes that can be hard if your licensee is a small entity and they don't have a lot of deep pockets. Um, licensors usually ask that the licensees have some sort of insurance, um, different kinds of insurance policies to cover the various risks. Um, not all bad acts can be insured against, um, but that is one way to try to mitigate your exposure. The territory. Yeah, so if you're you're saying if your if your intellectual property is cloud based, meaning it's useful, it's like a in cloud technology. Right. So I think you can allow your licensee to practice it wherever you say whatever territory you agree on, and you would just limit their, if you're talking about software technology, limit it to being hosted in whatever territory um, that you're comfortable with. Um, even if your, even if patents are only protected in a certain, certain countries within the world, you can still grant licenses beyond that, or the license to be practiced beyond that, because if, so say you have your technology is only protected in the US, uh, but somebody wants to make it in China. Well, they can go ahead and make it in China, and they won't be infringing on your patent rights, but they can never sell it into the U.S. Because as soon as they do that, they'll need that license from you. Right, if they make it and use it and sell it offshore, yeah, then they don't owe you any royalties. Nobody, anyone can do that anytime. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Right. Good evening. How are you doing? Very good, thank you. All right. Um, so as uh, Tali uh, mentioned, my name is Brian Stuff. I uh, work at Space and Naval Warfare System Center Pacific, so Space War System Center Pacific. It's a Navy lab here in San Diego. Um, just show of hands, who's familiar with Space War? All right. So most of you. So who knows it as the big, weird-looking buildings off the five by the by the uh, airport? All right. Okay, so hopefully, uh, you know, we'll be able, I'll be able to give you kind of a little bit of insight of who we are and how we relate to tech transfer and licensing. So, so we'll, I'll probably be giving you a, a license or perspective. Um, I think Tali did a great job of giving you an overview of licensing um, and so, you know, what we do at the Navy Lab. So please feel free if you have any questions, let me know. Um, so just overview, you know, who we are, tech transfer. Um, I'm going to sw swap it up. I'm going to talk about licensing agreements first and then talk about cooperative research and development agreements and then some other things that we do in technology marketing. Um, so who we are. So our bread and butter is, is the acronym called C4ISR, so Command and Control, Communications, Computers, Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance. It's a mouthful. So I, the way, the easiest way I look at it is we don't build planes, we don't build ships, we don't build submarines, we don't build missiles, um, but we help connect all of those through the IT and through the communications and sensors. So, so we help um, kind of let all of that talk to each other, display information so our, our leadership can make intelligent decisions. So, so we're kind of the IT command for the Navy. The buzzword currently right now is uh, information dominance. So we want to be able to use information um, just like we would a missile uh, to, for, for, to dominate that, that field. And so they see cyber as, as a, a, a big key part of that. So our laboratory employs about 4,300 employees. Uh, we have 2,400 scientists and engineers and technical folks. Um, and most of the 4,300 are here in San Diego. We do have offices in Japan, in Guam, and in Hawaii. So uh, the majority of it is here in Canada. Um, so there's our website if you need some more information. So introduction to technology transfer. So you know, I, I, I like this quote. This is part of the, uh, F, the fiscal year 2015 budget that President Barack Obama just put out. Um, so 
It talks about tech transfer. It talks about tech transfer and federally funded research. So there's billions of dollars every year spent on research within the federal apps, uh, within the you know use federal R and D dollars, and a lot of good can come from it. Um, so you know a lot of the ideas and inventions behind Google and smartphones have come from federally funded research. So um, this is kind of why we're doing tech transfer. Uh, it started in 1980 when Congress saw that you know there was a lot of money going into federally funded research, and they're not seeing a, a return, you know, whether it be out of the federal laboratory system or whether it be out of universities. So they started uh, a bunch of um, laws um, with the Stevenson Wilder Act, by Dole Act, to facilitate and promote technology transfer. And that's been, um, you know, improved upon through the years, um, and that gets carried down into. Uh, um, DOD instructions and Navy instructions, and in 2011, President Obama had released a uh, presidential memo on accelerating technology transfer from, uh, from federal labs and universities. So, so it's still, you know, it's it's an ongoing thing um, that, that I think that the, the administration and within the federal laboratory system are really trying to push federal tech transfer. Um, so. Uh, in the DOD world, the definition of tech transfer is the intentional communication or sharing of knowledge, expertise, equipment, and other resources for application to military and non-military systems. We're going to get similar de uh, definitions like this uh, across all the federal labs. Um, and so we're, we're unique because as a DOD lab, our primary mission is to support the war fighter, support the military. Um, so, uh, so we've kind of got a, uh, as you can see in the definitions, of kind of a dual use. We've got commercial applications, and we've got DOD military applications. So there are spin off or spin out activities. So we're, we're taking technologies developed within the lab and then kind of spinning those out. That's mostly what I'll be talking to you about here, um, out into industry, out into the entrepreneurial community. There's dual use, where technologies that could be used for both military and commercial applications. Um, then there is the spin-on activities where we're licensing or, or bringing in technologies from industry to, to meet our needs. Um, and uh, the, kind of the graphic there, what you see on the right, on the bottom right-hand side, is uh, there's a difference within the DOD world of technology transfer and technology transition. So technology transfer uh, in, in our world is kind of getting the technologies out into industry, academia, um, for commercialization. And then transition is to get it back into the hands of the warfighter or the military. Um, so two primary vehicles that we use are cooperative research and development agreements and patent license agreements. Um, as Tali mentioned, a patent license agreement is allows uh, a partner to make use and sell uh, a government-owned technology. Um, and a, a cooperative research and development research and development agreement. Uh, it, provides an opportunity for collaborative R&D for mutually beneficial results. And so I'll talk a little bit about both of those here shortly. So I want to talk about uh, license agreements first. So, um, you know, our de my definition of a license agreement is the same one that, that Tali gave, uh, and it really allows someone to make use of and sell your technology. As a government lab, our technology is owned by the U.S. government, so by Department of Navy, um, and uh, our researchers that work at our lab, part of their employment is required that they assign their rights to the government. So, um, so uh, you know, the government is responsible for licensing that technology. So we act as the role of the licensor and the company to license that IP. Um, so for us, we can license issued patents. We can license patent applications that are pending at the U.S. PTO office, and we can license invention disclosures. So. Our researchers, if they come up with an invention, the first thing they do is they fill out an invention disclosure and submit that to our internal patent office. And that, that gets assigned a, uh, an internal Navy case number. So that right there is what we define as an invention, and we have the ability to license that all the way up through uh, patents. So uh, to get into a little bit of the terms, um, so we do partially exclusive licenses or non-exclusive licenses. So Partial exclusive license, we don't do exclusive licenses because the government, at least in our lab, always retains government use rights. So, so, the gov so I don't want to license something and eliminate 
the ability for the government to go and make this or use it um, for our purposes. So, so we always retain that right. So we call it a partially exclusive license. Um, it's about as close you're gonna, as, as you're going to get to an exclusive license, um, depending on some of the things that Holly mentioned, field of use, uh, the, the, the territory that we license in. Um, so there's two requirements for a potential licensee. They need to submit an application to license, and they need to submit what we call a commercialization plan. So that really is a, a business plan on how a potential licensee is going to take our technology and commercialize it. So the reason why we license, um, actually I'll, I'll talk about it in a couple of slides, but we don't want somebody to come in and say, oh, the government has a competing technology to mine. I'm going to license it from them and just sit on it. Um, so we don't we we don't allow that. So we really want to make sure that a licensee is going to achieve and move that technology towards commercialization. So uh, uh, so they need really need to submit a business plan, a commercialization plan, how they're going to do that. Um, so some of the fees and and the the terms of the royalty uh, we have an upfront. Typically these are typical the royalties, most all negotiable. So we have usually an upfront fee. So to get uh, you know, so we want to show, we want to know that the licensee has some skin in the game and that they're committed to this. So we ask for usually an upfront fee. Um, there are minimum annual royalties. So every year you're required to pay us something. So that kind of is in line with, you know, we want to make sure that you're moving towards commercialization. So we make you actually pay something um, as you move forward to commercialization to keep you kind of moving in the right direction. Um, then we have a running royalty, which is usually a percent of net sales. Um, so uh, that percentage is negotiable. So we've also done uh, sometimes where it's if you're selling a widget, um, you know, you, we get ten dollars for every widget you sell. So it may not be a percentage, but it just may be a, uh, sort of like a fixed dollar amount for per widget you sell. Um, so those are uh, the other one is a, a patent reimbursement fee. So that's to help offset the cost to maintain the license um, to um, to, we don't usually re try to recoup the full cost of prosecute, prosecuting a patent, um, but it's also to help uh, you know, manage the, the, the license agreement itself. So, so those are the kind of the four key you know fees and royalties that we have, in addition to the you know the, the territory, in addition to um, the field of use. So the territory for us is usually pretty simple. We we have mostly well, all U.S. patents. So our territory is the U.S. and our you know, Puerto Rico and the United States are our territory. Um, so uh, that, that's pretty standard. I don't, I don't think I've run across a case where we've actually split it up to say, you know, you get everything uh, the east of the Mississippi and another company will get everything west of the Mississippi or something like that. Um, but as far as field of use goes, that really is um, dependent on the potential company licensee on what they intend to do. And to get exclusivity or partially exclusivity, you really have to show us why you need exclusivity. Because from a government perspective, we want to make sure that everyone has a fair and open opportunity to license that technology. So if we're going to give exclusivity, you need to give us a pretty good justification of why you're asking for exclusivity. Um, So uh, the, the, the licensing is all done out of the technology transfer office that I run. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, the, the inventors uh, or researchers are a good source of information, um, but they assign their rights to us, uh, to, to the government, and so I'm, I'm, I'm the one negotiating for the government. And there's a potential conflict of interest, so we don't want the, the inventors involved because we do share our royalties with our inventors. So you know, their job is to, you know, do their research for the for the Navy and for the belt for the lab, not try to go out and try to find licensees. So they'll you know identify some potential partners and pass them on to you. So the, the, the benefits of why we enter into licensing agreements. So um, like I mentioned earlier, it's a it's a great opportunity to move Navy innovation from lab to market, and then ultimately uh, to transition to the military. So we want to use the economies of scale that um, that commercial industry can. can provide and then we want to increase and grow our commercial industrial base um, so there's more companies that can provide technologies to help support the world better um, so it promotes u.s economic development so job creation um, makes the u.s more competitive 
in the global marketplace, creates high-tech manufacturing jobs, provides a return on investment on the uh, federally funded R&D. So our taxpayer, taxpayer dollars, it provides us a return on that investment. And then uh, personal financial and work product ventures. So we do share our, uh, our royalties. Actually, um, it's written into the statute that the Congress has enacted. So we share uh, the first $2,000 per inventor per invention, and then the, the congressional statute is a minimum of 15%. The DOD raised that up to a minimum of 20%. And then for us at our lab, we wanted to increase, kind of you know, pay, develop, and, and uh, patent your innovations. So we actually share 40% of our, our royalties back with the inventors. So the way the formula works is the inventors get paid first, and if there's anything remaining, we share that with the lab. So, Probably in the last six to ten years, it's nominally worked out to about 80% of the royalties that we receive is put into the inventors and 20% stay at the lab. Uh, so these are just two examples of successful licensing agreements that we did. These are actually two examples of successful startup companies that we created. Um, so the one on your left is a company here, uh, both actually here in San Diego. The one on your left, Luminai Technologies. That was a, a former employee going to business school at San Diego State, uh, came across this technology, um, thought it was interesting, used it in his MBA program for marketing, market analysis, uh, business plan. And at the end, he was like, wow, this is a really, uh, this is a potential business opportunity. He quit the lab, created a company, licensed the technology from us. Um, it was a MEMS, the, the sensor that was developed originally for navigation, he saw an application in the oil and gas industry. Um, so that was in 2006, they went, started from a company of two. In 2014, they had over 20 employees. They brought in over $18 million of investment and uh, uh, revenue here into the San Diego area. Um, so we, we really treat that as a success story for us. The one on the right um, is a company called Assure Controls, and that was a company up in Vista, Carlsbad. So that made uh, an entrepreneur came across that technology. The technology was a water toxicity, uh, a way to measure uh, water toxicity using bioluminescent plants. So it's uh, you know, organisms that live in the ocean. They emit amount of light if they're, if they're exposed to toxins. So our researchers developed how to measure that light that gets emitted. So they developed, it was a big lab bench top device. We licensed it out, and they turned it into kind of a handheld tabletop device in the company here. Um, it was actually used in the Gulf oil spill in 2010. Um, so University of South Florida used that technology to, to help do water toxicity measurements. Um, that isn't as big of a company, so they've got about two, two employees and um, just over $2 million in total investment. So, um, so that's kind of a, you know successful licensing agreements. Um, from, from the, the Navy there. Uh, so the other agreement that I wanted to talk about was a CRADA. So that's a Cooperative Research and Development Agreement. So if you start a company or if you're part of a company and um, you know, the government, the Navy, any type of government, laboratory, they have expertise, they have information, they have lab space, they have people that you want to collaborate and get access to. You can enter into a CRADA. Um, so uh, you can share information, you can share people, you can share resources. Uh, the only thing is, is the money flow, the government can't fund the partner, the CRADA partner, um, but the CRADA partner could fund the government. So, so this is an opportunity to um, you know, commercialize technologies, to transition technologies, and both of those licensing examples um, entered into licensing agreements and CRADAs. So the license agreement gave them the ability to make use and sell it. The CRADA helped transfer the knowledge and the know-how from <coughs> our inventors and our researchers to the company. And so that's what they used the CRADAs for. They were used kind of in tandem uh, to help uh, accelerate that technology transfer and, and, and make it become successful. Um, so, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about this. Uh, the maximum duration can be five years, so even if you have a collaboration up to five years, usually three years in the new amendment, an additional two. Um, and then, you know, we have standard credit, we have limited purpose credit, where it's just a temporary loan in or out of in, uh, equipment or information. Um, and uh, we have some 
unique scenarios where I made some non-standard language changes or if the technology is classified or, or critical. Um, so we have that. And so some of the benefits for Creighton is, is getting access to uh, uh, resources that's not available to either party. So, so we enter into a lot of Creighton universities. It's happened to their, you know, their professors, their uh, lab space. We do a lot of creatives with industry because they have uh, you know, unique expertise um, and abilities that we can't get within the NAB and Creative. Um, so with that, and from, from a small business perspective or an entrepreneur perspective, um, so they, when Congress enacted all these laws, they encouraged to for big small business. So from uh, entering into credits, so they give preference to small business. Um, when we enter into license agreements, they give preference to small business. So if you have a small business and a large business, um, and they can equally, in, in our opinion, they can equally commercialize the technologies we are supposed to give preference to a small business. Um, so another one of the things that, that Congress enacted was that if you license a government technology, um, most the, the the technology or the product has to be mostly manufactured in the U.S. So, so they, that's how they want to create economic development here within the U.S. Um, create companies and create jobs. They do put that requirement on. You can't get a waiver to that, um, but the, the the upfront going in is you know majority of the manufacturing has to be licensed. What if there's no manufacturing? What if it's software? Um, then you don't have to worry about it. Okay. So, um, so a couple of other things that we do in the technology transfer office is so we market our technologies. Um, so how do we go about marketing the technologies? We put together a little one-page tip sheets, we call them. It kind of distills the technology into layman's terms. So we try to take the technical verbiage out of it and put it into uh, you know, someone that, something that you know, someone can pick up and read and understand. Um, so we try to pick out the key benefits, the application, potential applications, um, and kind of the development status of the technology. Uh, and then we also put together technology marketing videos. They're usually about two to five minutes long, um, uh, where you know they're, it's a prototype or something that's good for visual display or visual or video. So these are two primary ways that we market our technologies. But how do you how do you decide where to direct your marketing? How do you find your um, so because we're, we're a small office, so I'm the only full-time employee in the office, and I've got two uh, part-time contractors that help me. Um, so our methodology is to kind of come network and come to these types of events as, as much as I can, but also to take this, uh, our marketing material that we develop, and kind of just, you know, um, blast it out there. So we kind of cast a wide net and see who likes. So that's kind of been our strategy. Now, ideally, we would like to have more targeted marketing where we have a we identify technology, we've done some in-depth market research, and we say company X, Y, and Z would be interested, and then I can pick up the phone and you know start cold calling you know the business development firms, right? So that would be ideal. But because of the lack of resources that we have, you know, we try to send out emails. We put it up on our web uh, website. Um, so we put all those tip sheets, all those videos up on our website. Um, and uh, we have like uh, an email, we call it a uh, tech flash is what we call it. And, and when we have new technologies that we want to highlight, we'll send that email out to uh, people that have requested it to be added to our mailing list. Um, so publications, uh, we use portals where we can highlight our technologies. Um, so the federal labs have a consortium called the Federal Laboratory Consortium, so FLC, the second bullet there. So they actually have a uh, uh, technology locator or where you can search technologies available across all the federal labs. It's not an exhaustive search, but uh, it's a good place to start, and, and that's federallabs.org. Um, and uh, so that's how we market our technology. We try to, you know, we, will, we try to get it out there as, as, as best as we can. Um, but yeah, so with that, so you know, our tech transfer office has a just a group email address. Um, we have our corporate website. We have a YouTube channel where we uh, post most of the, all of our technology videos. 
um, and then my contact information. Questions? Yes. Right. The uh, Kevin Couch. The uh, one of the things I noticed in your introduction was that spin on activities so uh, one that you might bring on board says that uh, you're going to take them to, that it's going to meet mission needs at a lower acquisition cost, which is great. But uh, one of the things we're some of the technology out there is not designed to make it a lower purchase cost, but designed to make it last longer or be a lower sustainment cost. So it's all part of acquisition. The life cycle is all part of acquisition. Yeah. Okay, in your mind, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, Idle Harvest, what is it? So, Ardle Harvest is a, is a organization out of uh, the Detroit area. Um, their, their original, it's almost just like a technology portal. Um, their original focus was um, the auto industry. Um, and so they've reached out to the federal labs and the FLC, um, and so they want it to be kind of a hub where people can go to identify and find technology. So you know, people with technologies can go there and, and, and submit technologies, and people that need technologies can go there and say, I'm looking for technologies in this area. So Auto Harvest um, provided that. And, uh, so the name is kind of a misnomer. The original start was, was in the auto industry, but they've expanded beyond. But it's just a technology portal that we've provided some technology. At the beginning, you, you, you said a term, I didn't want to catch the second word. You said the recent, the most recent buzzword is information dominance. Dominance. Yeah. I, information dominance. Right. If you have this many technologies that are sitting on the CPAP, is there any maybe category? So, um, so we've tried to categorize our, our technology um, as best as we can. Um, so some of them are not categorized, but uh, the, the problem with the problem that I face is, you know, our research is very vast. So we have unmanned systems, um, we have uh, robotics, we've got communications, we've got satellites, we've got antennas, we've got a marine mammal program, so we've got dolphins and sea lions. Um, so uh, the way that we're set up is we're, we're like a company, so it's what we call a Navy working capital fund. So our researchers, you know, at the beginning of the year, we don't get, here's your $2 billion budget, go do research. Right? So um, our researchers actually have to go out and find sponsors for the, the work that they do. So. Um, so the, 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 the types and categories of intellectual property all kind of stem from the kind of research we're doing, and it's very broad. So you know, if, if you look at it, there's a lot of communications technology, there's a lot of uh, sensor technologies, um, there's a lot of, uh, our, our cyber area is, is just now beginning to grow, and so we don't have any patents or technologies in the cyber arena, but we have a lot of capability cyber, both offensive cyber and defensive cyber. So um, it's hard to categorize, but we're trying to work on that. At least to bucket, to put them in like big buckets. Yes. Uh, what percentage of agreements are licensing versus license all the spin off versus spin on? So um, I would say, right, well, right now 100% of all licenses. So to, for us to license in a technology and not go through the acquisition process, um, for our researchers, there'd have to be a strong justification on why we need to license in a technology um, for our research. And so there have been some opportunities where under a CRADA, where we cross-licensed, so under the research, under that agreement, you can use our technology, we can use your technology. Um, but just straight licenses, we don't have any right. Right, is your office the one that builds out and does the small business that you make research? No, so yeah, we have a we have an SDIR office. Oh, okay. So that's run out of our headquarters. And, and so uh, we focus on the office. Yes. Uh, 
Uh huh. So is that missing offset of their normal salary or is that actual bonus? Uh, it's an actual bonus. Yeah, so, so um, in 2008, um, we had one license agreement um, where they came in and licensed, they bonded and licensed 66 of our patents, and they gave us 2.3 million dollars. Um, and so there's a limit. So a government employee can't get more than 150 thousand dollars in royalties. In so we had one person come close, I think it was like a hundred, so they got a check for a hundred forty thousand dollars. The second question is of those four components of fees and royalties, if we consider a scenario where you know, researchers have done a lot of work on, on something for a few years, um, but it looks like the the, the paths that were filed on the work might not There's a company that's still interested in working with you on that technology. Perhaps licensing a patent is too efficient yet, but it probably won't ever be allowed. How would your thinking change in the structure of those four components? What would be important to you as a licensor at that technology? So if it's that one single, if that one single technology or IP that we license and we know is not going to be allowed, then that would terminate. So, so we can't license something that we know that's not patent. Um, and uh, even know how. Or? So, um, so the, the, the government we can't have trade secrets. So the, the government, as a government organization, can't have trade secrets. Um, if we if we license if we license know how, we have to have something to be able to collect royalties on those inventions. So, so one example is software. So the government can't hold, we can't obtain copyrights to software. So um, we have a lot of software, uh, you know, algorithms or whatever it may be, we have a lot of software. But because we can't hold copyrights, I can't go license, you know, like Microsoft does and say, I'm going to sell you a license to Microsoft software. Um, so what we do is uh, we'll license and we'll have our inventors put in an invention disclosure for the algorithm and the process behind the software. And we'll license that disclosure. And we, we may move it on to the patent application or whatever. But we'll license that disclosure. Um, and we'll provide the software as technical data as part of that software. So that's things that we've done. Um, I'm sorry, what's that? So it, it would be just like for so so we're licensing for a commercial application, right? So for the government, for us the government to use, there would be no licensing required. Um, so we would be licensing it to you as a software application for you to commercial application. I'm, I'm trying to play here Correct, but you don't have to go through a licensing agreement to do that. So if it's a GOTS and, and, and whether it's on a contract, then we have to provide it as government published information. Um, so that, that's, so really, the, the focus of why we're licensing is for commercialization, uh, and why we entered the license program. Uh, license out. But the, the, the maturity of the technology definitely does affect the fees, right? So. Um, the earlier the technology is, or the, so if, if you're licensing just an invention disclosure that has no claims, has, that hasn't been allowed by the USPTO, there's a lot more risk for the, the company or the licensee. So the value will, will, will you know, will, will reflect that, and so will the fees. So, um, you know, and the, the T2, the purpose of why we do T2 is very different than industry um, or even universities for that. So our purpose is to get the technologies out. So we want to get a return on this better than the research. Our purpose is not necessarily to make as much money as we can. Right? So, um, so a lot of industry will say, um, you know, you can't license anything 
unless you bring me hundred thousand dollars up front, right? So, so we don't have kind of like ceiling or floors and and, and ceiling, um, uh, minimums. I get that question all the time. Is you know, so so I want to license this technology. What's the minimum, right? So what do I need to bring up front? It, it really all depends. So if you're a light, if you're a startup, so those startups that we have, they have very little to no upfront cost for the license. So we kind of backloaded that. They say, okay, we're going to share the royalties at the end, or we're going to have increased minimum annuals uh, once they start bringing in revenue and investment. Um, so we're very flexible uh, in in the, the terms of li li the licensing agreement. So um, especially with startups, because we are, um, you know. We do want to encourage that. Uh, and actually, that reminds me. Uh, so the DOD recently came out with a uh, university center of excellence for technology transfer. Um, so that was awarded to Arizona State. And their purpose is to create startups based on DOD technology. And so they've, uh, Arizona State has asked to work with us. And so in the next probably six months, you're going to probably see um, our technologies up on a website, a portal. To a, for entrepreneurs to go up and evaluate and try to build management teams uh, and to uh, submit a, a business plan or commercialization plan of how they would go in. So, so we're trying to create uh, additional startups based on the DOD. Can you tell us what the business is that you're say, I'm wanting to license one of your technologies, but Arizona State's got the same one? Um, no, I can tell you about our intellectual property. So I can tell you our intellectual property is unencumbered, or um, you know we've got the rights. Like Talia mentioned, we have the rights to license it. We've got. I can't tell you what well, Arizona State has a similar patent. Oh, sure. I mean, they're, they're, because you said they were in agreement with SEC on licensing the technology. So I happen to be interested, not knowing what they were doing. Oh, so so. so you deep the flick and say. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, we're not licensing the, the, our technologies to Arizona State. So they're just putting our technologies up on a website. So we still, it's still ours. So there's nothing to be complete in that oh, yeah. Do you have any questions? Um, uh, I'll be around here for, for a little bit longer. So.